All right, good morning. Everybody enjoy the long weekend? Happy Easter, belatedly, or Passover, or whatever particular holiday you're celebrating this time of year. Maybe just happy being done with assignment two. Um, so today we're, uh, we're going to take, uh, we're done with file systems, and we're going to take a little bit of a, a grab bag week. We're going to do a lecture today on OS structure, and then on Friday we're going to do a lecture on operating system performance, and then my plan next week is to start talking about virtualization, which will be kind of the last major topic that we'll cover in the class. Um, so, um, we're still working on the grading. It's incredible that I am still saying that. And it's kind of embarrassing coming in uh, every day and, and still not having to sign zero graded, but oh, man, we're so close. Um, and I know I've said that like 50 times, so uh, I feel like the trust level in this room is low, and that's okay. Uh, clearly, we will have grades done before uh, May 9th or whatever it is, right? At some point, uh, they'll start coming after me with pitchforks. Um, but but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to prepare for that day, despite the fact that it might not be. What is going on? If they start to dismantle the building while we're having class, then I guess we'll stop early. Um, all right, and then assignment three should come out today, and I'm going to look into, I, you know, assignment three to me is the, the, kind of the culmination of the programming work for this class. Uh, traditionally, we've given students about three weeks to do it. I want to give you guys as much time as possible, so I'm going to try to figure out kind of like when when the latest possible date is that we can let you guys continue to work on assignment three. Uh, clearly, that's not going to be like July or something, but you know, as, as, <laughs> as, as, far, as far, and maybe you, would, you might want to keep working on it until July, um, but, but we'll, we'll figure that out, and I'm going to try to you know, give you guys as much time. At this point, I'm really more interested in you guys kind of doing the assignment, having fun with it. Uh, we also have an assignment two solution, which I'm guessing that a bunch of you guys will want to use that we're banging out a little bit. So, uh, so stuff's coming along with the course assignment. All right. Um, no review today. Uh, does anyone have questions about file systems that they would like answered, or questions about operating systems in general, uh, meaning of life sort of issues, anything, anything pertinent to discussion on a Wednesday morning uh, when we're here to talk about cool computer systems? All right. Um, so. A lot of times, uh, operating system classes start off talking about structure. And I think I'm more clever than other people who have taught this class, because I waited till now to talk about operating system structure, right? Because you guys have seen some of the pieces of the operating system now. You've seen you know, the process and thread support. Uh, you've seen, um, what else have we talked about? Let's see here. So we've done, we've done a couple of major units. This is kind of like mental uh, brain warm up this morning, right? So I'll start in the back. What else have we talked about? So we did scheduling and process management. What other big pieces of the OS have we discussed? Virtual memory. Virtual memory. All right, yeah, we talked about memory management. That's this like big hairy thing. John, what else? Uh, what were we talking about last week? Uh, file yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow, it's like I can see you paging it back in. You know, it's like pa page folds. <laughs> Address translation. What were we talking about last week? Last week, file systems, right? Um, and then there's and there's actually a lot of other things that operating systems are responsible for that we haven't really talked about. Uh, it partly, you know, most of the time I think these things get excluded from these sorts of classes because maybe they're a little bit less interesting. But there's still important functions. What other what other things does your operating system do that we haven't really discussed? Alex, what's what's one thing that? What's one thing you would probably be very sad if your computer didn't do? Boot? OK, no, the, yeah, yeah, OK. I like it. He just took it like straight from the top. <laughs> yeah, that would, yeah. Power on, right? We haven't talked about batteries. Um, boot, yeah, actually, and that's really, that's actually, uh, that's a great point, right? And then boot up, there's this whole boot process, there's boot loaders, it, and, and that's just kind of gross and disgusting, and it's a little, uh, so we didn't talk about it, right? But yes, it would be sad if your computer didn't boot. What else would it be sad if your computer didn't do that we haven't talked about? 
devices, right? Yeah, it'd be sad if you had a computer that, you know, you couldn't, like, you got your brand new, uh, you know, wireless uh, pointer thing or whatever it was, your new uh, special controller for playing Angry Birds even better, and uh, you plugged it in and it didn't work, so that would be sad. Uh, what, what, what else, though? You guys are missing something big, I think. I think. I don't know what you guys do with your computers, but I think you're missing something big. What else? What else? What other major part of the computer have we just not even touched on at all? What's that? We've talked about multitasking, Ben. Network stuff? Networking, right? Like if your computer wouldn't connect to the internet or didn't know about the internet or, or didn't think it was cool to talk to other computers, then you would probably be, be sad, right? I would be sad. I don't know how to use the computer that's not hooked up to the internet anymore. Um, so yeah, so we haven't talked about network protocol stacks. Sometimes that's covered in other classes, but typically these are implemented inside the operating system. So remember we talked about uh, 4.3 BSD, you know, the, the greatest software ever released. One of the big things in that was the TCP IP protocol stack, which has kind of spread its way into all sorts of other things. So yeah, network protocol stacks we don't talk about. Network protocol stacks are really hard to design, as you would imagine, right? Actually a lot of the same design considerations we're gonna talk about today uh, influence some of the design of protocol stacks, right? Um, what, what about this sort of stuff, right? I mean, maybe this is a little bit less pertinent to your day-to-day -day life, but um, big multitasking, multi-user operating systems uh, spend a lot of time sort of tracking uh, and trying to control what users are doing, right? So if you log into Timberlake, uh, you hopefully won't be able to make the machine slow for everybody, right? Uh, you might be able to make it slow for you, uh, but there's a lot of these things that go on in terms of uh, Shutting, you know, I had this happen to me on EC2 the other day, actually. I was running, uh, what was I running? Oh, yeah, I was actually, I was running some stuff that is trying to, like, change some of the schema for the databases that we're using to store the course information, and it ran so long and got killed, right? And I felt like that was kind of sad, because it was on a machine where I was the only user. So I was scratching my head. I was like, oh, who, who, who was killed on whose behalf, right? This is my machine. Just, just let me use it. Um, but on, how, I mean, how many people have ever run something on a big multi-user system that's been killed because it, uh, it ran out of resources or ran too long or whatever? I had a, I had a friend, do you guys remember SETI at home? How many people remember SETI at home? How many people ever ran SETI at home? So SETI at home was a system where you could, uh, they would distribute tasks and you could process information from outer space looking for aliens. And for a while, this was this really kind of fun example of a, a pretty interesting sort of peer-to-peer. -peer. I guess maybe they would call that crowdsourcing now, right? Um, so I had some friends at college that were competing over how to, um, how many packets they could process. They used to have a, a bulletin board where they would post like, here's the person who processed the most packets last week. It's kind of stupid, right? Because it was like, you know, yeah, all my machines are slow because I'm competing to process the most steady at home packets. Um, but people got into this for whatever reason, because people will compete over anything if there's a competition being held. And some of them started to run their steady at home jobs on the campus's central mail server, right? Uh, you can imagine these are really uh, in CPU intensive jobs. And they kept getting killed off, right? So a friend of mine came up with a clever way of getting around this. How many people used Pine, the email client? There's a popular email client, text-based email client called Pine. And this is, you know, again, this is how old I am, I guess, is that we used to use Pine when I was in college for checking email, right? The, the interweb was in its kind of like early stages and uh, there weren't a lot of web-based email clients, so you would log in and use Pine. So he thought that he would be able to get away with running his study at home job, and the way he did it was that he renamed the executable to Pine 2000, right? This was, you know, 1999, right? And then he just sat there and let it run. I think it ran for a few days before the system administrators realized that Pine 2000 was in fact not some sort of like really CPU intensive email client and in fact just some sort of CPU hog that he was running to try to compete. So anyway, I think, I think maybe the funniness of that story is lost on you guys, right? Because you guys don't know what SETI and Home or Pine are, right? But look, I tried, okay? Um, all right, and then, you know, we talked about device drivers, right? So, yeah, we would like our system to actually be able to interface with devices. And th these are all really interesting topics. I'm not trying to poo-poo them, but we just haven't, haven't really talked about it. So, clearly, there's a lot going on in the operating system, right? So, you know, if I started to come up 
with some sort of diagram about how the operating system components relate together. And this is, <laughs> this is I found this diagram like five places on the internet. I came up with a slightly more interactive version of it. Uh, but, you know, and then I've got all these different pieces. I've got this protection module, memory management, and some sort of accounting subsystem, uh, maybe a command interpreter that I'm running. And I start to try to, like, figure out the dependencies that these components have on each other, right? And then I'm going to add in some other things that I might need, like information services, like proc, and, and I've got file systems that I'm running. I need the I.O. subsystem to communicate with I.O. devices. And I start to, like, you know, uh, try to understand how this is going to work, and it just gets grosser and grosser, right? So this is kind of you know, the canonical uh, mess that you get into with, with operating system design is that it, it's, it's really difficult to, to impose any sort of structure on this, right? Um, one of the earliest multi-programming systems that was called THE, um, which was actually uh, designed by Edward Dijkstra, right, who is famous for a bunch of other reasons. That was back when, if you were brilliant like Edward Dijkstra, you could contribute in systems and algorithms and all sorts of other ways, right? Now, now you have to focus a little more. Um, but anyway, so he, uh, and he had this model of like the layered operating system, which I don't have on here, right? And really, nobody adopted that model, partly because it doesn't work, right? Like, it would be great if your operating system have layer, had layers, right? But it doesn't. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I wanted to, I know I showed this video at the very beginning of class, but I wanted to show this video again just because I love the, uh, I don't know if, if you guys were here on the first day or if you missed the slide. Uh, the slide is really the most impressive thing, right? So did you guys catch that? So this, wait, why is it, oh, I've got to play it over here. Sorry. Here we go. All right, so there we go. So this is kind of like what, this is kind of like what we're getting into, right? Um, and I, I think I told you this, when I, when I saw the movie, I was like, they had to make that up. There's no way that there was ever a slide this complicated that Matt put up in, OS 16, in, in CS161. And then I went back and looked at the slide decks, and sure enough, that very slide is in there, right? So I think they, I think they must have actually cut and pasted the slide itself. So, so anyway, this is actually a virtual memory management slide, but, but you, get the, you get the idea, right? Like, this, this stuff can get really, can get really ugly, right? All right. Okay, and, and essentially what we're talking about and what we have been talking about throughout the semester is a kernel structural model that we call the monolithic kernel, right? The, like the monolith. What was a monolith? It makes, that's making me think of, uh, think of uh, 2001 Space Odyssey for some reason, right? right? This big thing. It's just one big thing, right? So essentially, what's our model of the world, right? We have user programs. We have this system interface right here. We have devices. We have these low-level interfaces for communicating with devices. Maybe we use, you know, we read and write to their ports directly through memory, right? And then in the middle, we have everything else, right? Like this is the kernel, right? And everything is in here. Everything uh, can potentially you know, cross this interface, and everything runs with essentially kernel privileges. Right? So this is the model that we've used uh, throughout the semester. Right? And this is really how a lot of operating systems are designed. Probably most of the major operating systems you guys are familiar with use this design. Right? So again, all OS code is loaded into the same shared address space, right? So the kernel has an address space. The kernel address space usually has you know, special permissions and can access all of memory directly, right? Uh, or, or in some ways, which is required so that I can multiplex memory, right? So I load all the code that runs in the kernel runs with the same set of protections and the same access to all of the memory on the system, right? Uh, all the OS code is potentially privileged, right? So it has access to these privileged CPU instructions that we talked about before. In contrast, no user code is privileged, right? So this is the privilege boundary here. It's black and white. Like OS code, totally privileged. User code, totally unprivileged, right, when it comes to these privileged instructions. Um, and, and what happens here is that all the OS code is structured as one program. And as you guys have started to do some development yourself, how would you characterize that big program? Anybody? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of gross, right? Like, it's all kind of sitting in there. It's all trying to, you know, it, it, in, unless you impose some structure on it, it this could, has the potential to get really, really gnarly and disgusting, right? Because, you know, I mean, it's just C code, right? You can do whatever you want, right? And, and there's, no, there's no need for you to actually obey interface conventions. You can do all sorts of things. You guys have been kind of finding this out a little bit, right? So this seems, I mean, does this seem like a good idea to anybody? 
I mean, this kind of seems like a terrible idea, right? This seems like a, a slide about how, you know, we, we talked throughout the class about one of the reasons to study operating systems, which is that these are these really mature, really sort of uh, elegant and well-designed systems because people have been working on them for decades and decades, right? So why have people stuck with this monolithic model of how to structure the kernel components themselves? What do people think? What are some of the things that, I mean, given the fact that this seems kind of I mean, it's, it would make you nervous, right? Like, let's say you went to work at a, to work at a big software company, and they were like, we are going to design, um, you know, let's see, what am I going to call it? Uh, you know, new OS, right? Or Lindos or whatever. I mean, pick, a, pick your name for a, a new catchy operating system, right? And you were like, OK, great, so what's our plan? And they were like, we don't have a plan. Let's just start writing code. Um, so why, why would people do this? So, so again, what are, the th what are some of the things that seem appealing about this? <coughs> Give me one. I mean, just, it, no, so, so what's hard? I mean, okay, just again, like you're just saying, okay, I'm just going to get right down to work. I mean, that sounds good, right? I mean, you can just get started, right? So I can just sit down and start hacking, right? I don't need to plan, you know? I mean, I, I just sort of like <laughs> sit down. It's, it's like the way you guys approach your assignments for this class, right? Or maybe the way that you wanted to approach them until, until you've started to learn otherwise, right? Just sit down with the assignment web page and start trying to write code, right? Uh, and monolithic kernels make it easy to do this, right? OK. <laughs> What's that? You don't agree with this anymore. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so, what, what else, right? It's it's actually really fast, right? This is probably one of the, the, the most important reasons for the enduring success of this potentially terrible uh, model of OS structure, right? Because if you think about it, you know the interaction. You know, let's say you write your file system code and then you write your virtual man memory management code, and as we talked about, there are some dependencies there. Like this is one of the things that makes it very difficult to structure operating systems as a stack, right? So for example, the virtual memory management subsystem might want to use files for swapping, right? But the file system wants to use the memory management as a buffer cache, okay? So I challenge you to find the right way to stack those two modules, right? They don't stack, right? They both have dependencies between them. If you write them as one big blob of code, you know, like your file system just makes function calls through the virtual memory interfaces, and it can use whatever interface it wants. It can use internal interfaces. It can, you know, uh, create its own functions to, to deal with memory more efficiently, whatever, right? So as opposed to some of the things we're about to talk about, the overhead between transitions between modules, I mean, they're not even really transitions. It's just making another call up or down the call stack, right, in C. It's, it's trivial, okay? So this is, this, these, these are some of the nice reasons, right? But there are all sorts of problems with this approach, right? And a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of really interesting operating system research has been looking, or I shouldn't say research, I mean research and development that have been trying to address some of these problems. So let's talk about them individually first, and then I'll present sort of some of the, uh, if I can stay on my feet, I'll present some of the approaches to dealing with them, all right? Okay, so first question, right? How, how is the monolithic kernel not like the Boy Scout model, right? So who remembers the Boy Scout model? Does anyone know what the Boy Scout motto is, other than me? Yeah. Be prepared. The Boy Scouts had a motto and a slogan. And I think this, this is actually the motto. I used to get them confused. The slogan is, do a good turn daily. Uh, but the Boy Scout motto, it's both, both nice things, right? Be prepared, OK? So how is a, this monolithic rigid kernel, rigid? Uh, not like the Boy Scout model, right? So, so going back to some of the things that you expect your kernel to be able to do, what's a way to challenge this monolithic kernel and, 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 and kind of exp expose one of the flaws in this particular design? Well, it has to weigh your okay, no, okay, no, we're going to get to that. Be prepared for all sorts of weird stuff to happen, right? So well, that, that, that's coming next, right? But, but what, other, what other events might a kernel uh, be forced to deal with that could, that could strain kind of this put everything into one blob and that's it sort of model? Can't add to it. Can't add to it. When would I want to add to it? Ah, right. So let's say I plug in a new device. 
Let's say you go out to Best Buy, you get your brand new, this is, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, uh, trying to think about, okay, so uh, this is probably a terrible example because Best Buy probably didn't exist, but it's like the mid-1980s and, you know, you've come home with a brand new computer mouse, right? And you don't have a GUI yet, but you just figured the mouse would be fun to have, right? Um, so, <laughs> but you've decided that you've got this mouse and you're going to plug it into your computer and the model of the kernel is like, Nah, not so much, right? Uh, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to talk to it. And if you want to use that thing, uh, you got to sit down with the source code and like you got to make some changes to the kernel configuration and then recompile me and reinstall your machine. And then you can use your new device, right? So this is kind of terrible, right? So one, one challenge, oh wait, sorry. <laughs> one, one challenge we have here is, again, just how do we maintain some degree of flexibility? Now, what's, what's the alternative approach, right? So let's say I want to be the, like, because <laughs> even in the Boy Scouts, there's, there's some a balance between preparedness and over-preparedness, right? So how would, what would the over-prepared monolithic kernel do? Say I'm sitting down to compile my kernel, and I want to be ready for anything. So what, what would I do? What's that? No, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're too modern, right? No, I want, I, I'm a monolithic kernel. I have no idea of pluggable modules. We'll get to that. I, uh, but I want to be ready for anything, right? So what do I do? I would already have a copy of code which is to handle this. Right. I've got to include every possible device driver for every possible device ever that ever exists at the time of compilation, right? So when I sit down and compile my code, I'm just going to compile everything into the kernel. Now that sounds like a great idea. What's, what's the problem with that? What happens to your kernel as you start to include more and more and more code? It, it may get slow, but it probably is going to get what? Huge. Remember, the bootloader loads the kernel into memory. Right? And, and kernels have, you know, modern kernels have some ability to page out pieces of their code that they're not using. But still, you end up with this massive kernel executable. So it would be kind of fun to see if you went and you configured Linux to, to build every possible device driver into the Linux kernel itself. I wonder what the size of the resulting image is. Probably massive. Right? And most kernels don't do this for this very reason. So, so this, this is the trade-off here, right? I can include everything, but then I'm like the proverbial Boy Scout that can barely move, right? Because he's so like weighed down with like extra backpacks and 16 extra shoes in case the 15 uh, don't work. At the, you, know, you know what I mean? Like you can imagine trying to hike with that person. Um, all right, so. Uh, I don't know if you guys can, can read this cake. It might be better if you can't read the cake. Um, so, 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 but if you can read the cake, how is the monolithic kernel like this cake? Can anybody read the cake? Okay. So how, how is the monolithic kernel like this, this particular cake? What ruined this cake? This is a nice cake, right? I mean, it's got really nice designs up here. Uh, it's got this nice red around it. You know, it has uh, an, a nice message. Uh, it, at least it wanted to have a nice message. So what, what ruined this cake? Poor handwriting. What's that? Poor handwriting. Poor, okay, poor handwriting, <laughs> right? Uh, but what else, right? I mean, let, let's say that this isn't just a handwriting problem. Let's say it's a, a deeper issue. So, so again, I mean, what's that? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. So that's, that's not the problem with the cake. Uh, if you can't read the cake carefully, there's, uh, the cake is supposed to say, best of, best, best of luck, we will miss you. Uh, and there's been a, a typographical error here um, <laughs> that has rendered the cake obscene, right? So, but again, what's the point here, right? I mean, there are like 20 letters in this sentence. What happened? <coughs> You get one, you make one little mistake, right? And it just can ruin the whole cake, okay? This probably, cake probably tasted really good, actually. Uh, and it would probably be funny to eat it just because of what it says. Um, so what if, you, what if your kernel just has one little problem, in it, right? One little problem. How many of you guys found a small problem in your assignment two code that was having a large impact on the uh, overall functionality? I think everybody's hand should be up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, small. Just one, one little thing. It's like you, 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 that, that stupid 
uh, asterisks, you know, like that, that I, there should have been an asterisk there, or you know, there should have been like one additional ampersand that just that needed to be there. So, so again, just and, and those are those are little little mistakes, right? But I mean, one little problem can really bring bring kernels to their knees, especially monolithic kernels, because like some like you pointed out, everything's running in this privileged address space, right? So if anything does something bad, the whole system is just going to collapse. Right. OK. Yep. I mean, you guys have started to see this message maybe on a regular basis. So I think that's what it says. Is that what it says? I didn't actually initiate a panic to see this, but I've, I, I should know what it says. Right? I've seen this. I guess I'll just die now. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, <laughs> it's such a nice message. OK, so we, I mean, we've, we've covered this a little bit. <laughs> Clearly, you guys cannot see what this is. Uh, so there was, a, there was this really interesting article uh, a couple of years ago about how much time the military spends writing PowerPoint slides. So apparently there are, there are like upper level officers in the military who almost the entire, their entire job is to write PowerPoint slides, right, for these presentations that they give, right? And this is uh, one <laughs> something that was included in one of these slides. Um, and this is, I guess this is actually, um, let me see if I can even read this if I get close enough. This, this is something that was supposed to be uh, describing the relationships between different um, like tribes or warring parties in Afghanistan. Uh, and you know, like someone spent a long time, and I'm sure there's actually a lot of information content in that. But in a PowerPoint talk, it's probably difficult to see clearly enough to see this. So, so again, what, you know, what is the, you know, you start off writing your kernel and you start off on day one and it's so simple and you're just doing a few things. And then what's happened by day, you know, 150? What's, okay, so let's say you start off writing assignment two and everything seems really clear and what's happened by day 10? <laughs> right, I guess I'll die now, right? You see that a lot. But, but in the meantime, like, stuff's get, stuff gets ugly, right? Stuff gets nasty. And it's just, you know, you do something and you're like, well, this is OK to do it this one way. And then pretty soon you've got this ugly, disgusting mess, right? And, and this can happen just way too easily, right? And then once you've got this ugly, disgusting mess, then, you know, what happens if, you know, you, or God forbid, somebody else, right, someone who isn't familiar with your own private universe uh, needs to come in and make a change, right? I mean, to some degree, this is, I shouldn't say to some degree, to, the, to a major degree, this is why we don't use Linux for this class, right? It's just too complicated. And, and the Linux designers, I'm not saying that they, they punted on this, right? Like, they've done a lot to think about the structure of the code and, and to try to, 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 to do it in a way that makes sense, but at the same time, you know, eventually this kind of naturally happens, even if you do your best to resist it. And the best you can do is to try to make things as cleanly documented and as, you know, uh, as uncomplex as possible. We're talking about really complex systems, right? Especially when we start to talk about modern operating systems. You know, I remember when I was working at Microsoft, I spent, this, I spent one really frustrating morning pouring through this piece of code trying to figure out what it did. It was, it was this piece that was in the memory management subsystem and it was really complicated. I was like, what is happening? And then I decided to, to let the preprocessor do some work for me. So I compiled the kernel for my target platform, and I looked at the preprocessor output, and it turned out that none of the code I looked at was being included. Right? It was all being destroyed by preprocessor macros. It was like, if you're running on a machine with three gigabytes of memory, and it's divided into pieces that are a prime number size, and et cetera, et cetera. Like it, it was just this really, really specialized corner case. But it was this huge blob of code that was really hard to understand. It was dealing with that. right? So, so operating systems have had, uh, sort of had this happen. Right? Um, all right. So, so today I just want to uh, talk a, bit, a little bit about some solutions to these problems, right? And again, this is not to say that there are not other problems with the way that we design kernels and, and a lot of other interesting aspects of the way that we design kernels, but I just chose to, to focus on these three. All right, so, and, and again, the operating systems community over time has dealt, has tried to deal with some of these structural problems, right? Because these, these structural problems have real consequences, right? I mean, rigidity makes it difficult to use the system. Safety makes the system fail, right? And complexity, I would argue, sometimes gives rise to those other problems. Like the reason why, you know, complexity and safety in particular are very intertwined, right? I mean, the reason 
why kernels in many cases are not safe or have bugs is because they're so hard to understand. And so when people sit down to try to improve them or add features, they make mistakes. Right? All right. So, so rigidity is really a catch-all phrase that, that it could potentially encompass a wide variety of different problems. I don't want to talk about all of these, right? Um, but, but there's been work that has been done on, on all sorts of, of different aspects of rigidity, right? So today we're really going to focus on the first one, which is rigidity in terms of what devices the system could support, right? So when I boot up, um, there's a certain set of devices that are attached to the computer, and over time, as the computer runs, that set might change, right? There might be new devices that get plugged in that the kernel has never seen before. There might be old devices that I've seen, but, but that are not always attached, right? Um, but there's been other aspects of rigidity that have also been explored, right? So one, one thing we talked about a little bit, especially when we talked about scheduling, was that the operating system um, has this very, very thin, narrow interface that it tries to preserve and use for interacting with user processes. And the narrowness and thinness of that interface means that there's a lot of things that processes might want to tell the kernel that they can't, right? Things about how they're using memory, things about how they would like to be scheduled. And kernels do their best to guess those things, right, given the visibility they have into application behavior, but they don't always do a great job. And you might think, hey, you know, like there's some applications out there that might know things that would be useful for the kernel to know. I'm never going to use this page again, right? I, I cannot run and do useful work unless these conditions are met, right? So there's no point in scheduling me and doing the whole context switch overhead, paging in my memory, just so that I can check these conditions and go back to sleep, right? So maybe you should try to help me with this, right? Um, so those are kind of like the last two. Um, and, and again, I mean, the, the, the real reason we have this narrow, thin interface between the kernel and user programs is safety, right? It's because the kernel doesn't trust things in user space. And the smaller I can make that interface, the fewer ways there are to enter into the kernel, the fewer uh, functions the kernel has to support that processes are allowed to call to request access, the, the, less, you know, the, the fewer sort of uh, holes in the fence I need to defend. Right? So is, is if I made my interface huge and big with all these sort of uh, new features and new ways for the application to interact with the kernel, now I've got to support all of that extra code. Right? And that's, that's difficult. And that creates more of an attack surface, quote unquote. It's not always an attack. It might just be you know, idiot proofing things. Right? Processes do dumb things. Uh, and and pro programmers make mistakes. Kernel programmers never make mistakes. But user programmers make mistakes all the time. Um, all right. So, as Ben pointed out before, one of the ways that we work on the flexibility with respect to devices is simply by modularizing the kernel, right? And particularly modularizing support for devices, right? There, you know, you, you don't, there, there are some components of the computer that come and go, and then there are other components that don't. So, for example, uh, for, this has started to improve, but for a long time, uh, Linux and other uh, operating systems really had very little support for hot swapping disk drives, right? Because the assumption was kind of like, there better be a drive there, and if it's attached when you boot, you better not detach it, right? Because I'm just not sure what I'm going to do as the kernel if you take the drive that I've got my swap file on, and hey, like, hey, I'm going to disconnect that drive, right? So, you know, the same thing with memory, right? I mean, I, I don't know, I wonder if this is actually true. Like, hot swapping memory, I mean, how many people reach into their machine and like pull out a stick of RAM while it's running? Because they're like, you know, I need this for another machine, man. My other machine needs more RAM, so I'm going to pull this out and, and put it over there. Uh, not, not, uh, not a common use case, right? Same with the CPU, right? You know, get in there, you know, scrape, the, scrape the grease off, pop it up, you know, it's a little warm, cool it off. Uh, move it over to another machine, needs an extra port, right? So, so these things are usually just baked right into the system, right? But to the degree that things come and go, um, you know, we, we, we might want some support for that, right? And the solution is, is something that a lot of you guys may or may not be familiar with. How many people have, have, have ever sort of uh, done anything that's touched the loadable module system on Linux? Like inserting modules, removing modules, rebooting things? Okay, a couple of... Of, of sort of hardcore uh, Linux hackers uh, in, the, in the audience. Um, so, so what happens on Linux is simply that uh, most, actually a lot of parts of the kernel are modularized, right? So what, they're, they're built in a way so that they can be separated from the kernel, right? So when you configure Linux, there's a bidil, 
yeah, that's not a word, a bajillion different options, that's not a word either, but it's a word that people know as being a big number, um, that you can enable or disable support for different types of hardware, different chipsets, different features, different file systems. And normally your choices are you can include it in the kernel, which means that it's baked into the kernel, that the kernel image. And in some cases, that's good, right? Let's say like ext4. I'm going to install a bunch of systems with ext4 on it. I might as well just have that kernel be part of the that, that code be part of the kernel image, right? Sometimes the kernel needs certain modules to boot, right? Um, but these things can also be compiled as modules. So when you configure Linux and when you use things like Ubuntu, the Ubuntu kernel ship with most things compiled as modules. And what happens is that if the kernel detects that it needs that code, it loads the code into the operating system, right? So these modules are stored on disk. And then if, um, if the kernel needs them, if you insert a device that requires a certain driver to function, the kernel will look for it and then try to load it into the, into the running address space. And the code just executes as, as normal, right? So this is a very, very clever idea, right? Um, you know, again, they can be independently recompiled, so I can actually ship new modules that, that, uh, um, that, that might correct bugs. Like there is, obviously, there's some coupling between the core operating system image and the modules, right? So usually there are uh, symbols that, that the kernel will look at in the module to determine if, if it is safe to load that module into the currently running kernel. But, you know, again, I mean, you, you can certainly, as long as you're compiling with the same kernel source, you can fix bugs in modules and load them, reload them into the kernel to fix problems without stopping the machine, right? So this is kind of a really nice feature. And these are supported, you know, in, in one way or another on really every modern operating system, right? Linux has uh, loadable kernel modules. Uh, Mac has something called Kext. Um, I've built a couple, maybe I shouldn't say this on camera, but I've built a couple of, of Hackintoshes and I, so I've got a little familiar with Kext. I, I, if, you want, if you want to find out what it was like to play around with Linux circa 1998, uh, try installing a Hackintosh, right? It's kind of, it's, it's really the same user experience as it used to be, you know, where you spend like three or four days trying to get it to work and then you make one change and you have to start all over. Um, so anyway. I've gotten better at it over time. Um, all right, so let's, talk, so let's go to the second problem, right? So safety, right? So, you know, people hate when their operating system crashes, right? I mean, again, remember, um, I can't remember who said this, maybe it was Margo, but, you know, the, the worst bugs are the ones that give your users not only the time, but the inclination to call you up and complain, right? Or hunt you down via email or Twitter or Facebook or whatever, right? And you know, stop the crashes that stop the system and cause it to reboot, right? Maybe you need to repair the file system at that point. Those are terrible, right? And those give people time to call Microsoft on the phone. Okay, um, you know, kernels don't like to crash either, right? I mean, this is a major goal of operating system uh, development. What's what's the uh, what's the interesting factoid here that's missing from this equation, right? Uh, what, what what about? What's, what's the problem here from a, from a kernel's perspective? If you're Microsoft or Apple, right? You're getting all these calls. People are like, my computer just crashed, et cetera, et cetera. What, what's, what's, the, what's the frustrating thing? What? No clue what caused Well, OK. Some clue, but. You might have some clue, right? The person may have carefully copied down all of those hex codes on the blue screen of death, right? <laughs> like, this is what, actually, when Linux crashes, like, this is what the Dell developers tell you to do. Like, get out a pen and paper, right? And carefully, like, copy down. People do this, right? Because it's really useful information. Maybe now you take a screenshot and send it to them. I hope that's what people do, right? But if, if your Linux machine was your only piece of technology and it died and it, and it generated this error dump, you know, you would carefully write it down because that's, that's like the machine's last will and testament, right? Um, the fact is that, that kernel code doesn't cause a lot of operating system crashes. Core kernel code does not cause very many crashes. Most crashes aren't caused by faults in the virtual memory management system. They're not caused by null pointer exceptions within the kernel on you know, system call paths, for example. Right? So what causes them? People see this all the time. Right? People cause them, yes. I pushed the blue screen of button. <laughs> Stop pushing the blue screen of death button on your computer. We told you not to do that. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, so you had the answer. Device drivers, right? So Mike, I, I read somewhere, Microsoft estimated something like 90% of crashes in XP are caused by device drivers, right? 
And you know, the, the, and, and look, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not here to defend Microsoft. I think it's a company full of a lot of really nice people. Uh, but you can imagine that they find this really frustrating because they work really hard on the core operating system components, right? Got a big group of people. They've got some really talented developers. They test their stuff really rigorously. You know, they write it and they rewrite it. They, they did this, you know, one of the reasons that Vista was delayed was they did this massive security audit that went on for several years where almost every line of code, as far as I was told, was read and rewrite by several people who didn't write it, you know, to look for buffer overflow problems and things like this. And, you know, and then this Yahoo that works for like, I don't know, Logitech or something, you know, writes this buggy, crappy device driver. But who do you think the users call when it fails, right? Windows crashed, right? They, know, they don't know it's the device driver, right? So Microsoft fields all of these calls from angry users and all of these, you know, all this gets all this vitriol, right? Because they provided a platform that allows other people who you know, maybe uh, applied for a job at Microsoft and didn't get one because they couldn't write really good code to, to essentially create problems for Microsoft. Right? So a lot of these issues are caused by other people, but, but people don't know that. Right? And it's not, you know, it's not user's fault. Like They bought Windows and Windows crashed. Right? And, and they, don't, they don't associate the fact that Windows crashed which, with, oh yeah, I bought that really dodgy like $30 uh, extension the other day and plugged it in and I did download the device driver from this uh, Russian website. And you know, I clicked OK to eight different dialogues when I installed it that said, are you really sure you want to do this? Right? Including the one that said, this may crash your computer every time you use it. But I clicked OK. Now, Microsoft. You know? Anyway. Um, so, one of, the, one of the things I, I think is interesting, I, I heard this somewhere and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find a, a reliable source for it, but it, but it seems uh, very possible, right? Which is that um, a lot of device drivers are developed in a, in a kind of an, an unfortunately standard way for the, for the programming community. Namely, uh, there are, you know, so, so again, the, the slide kind of gives it away, right? So, you know, Logitech comes out with uh, Magic Wheel Mouse version 4.0, okay? And uh, you're the programmer that's hired to write the device driver for Magic Mouse version 4.0. So what do you do? You take the 3.0 code and you hack it until it works, right? Okay. So and and but what's the interesting thing that what's the interesting thing that this causes, right? So you can think of yourself. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say you're giving birth to new code. Uh, no, no, no. So, so you are, but you're creating this ancestral relationship, right? Like you took the version 3.0 code, and if you were using something like Git, you know, you created a branch, or you just you just created your own new repository and you added some stuff and things like that. But, but what what is this? What does this? Ha what means? Blah, blah, blah. So, what happens when there? I'll just read the slide. That's usually the simplest thing. What happens when there are bugs upstream? Right? So the 3.0 guy had some sort of you know, really interesting little race condition, or he was using an interface improperly and making some assumptions about side effects. What happens to your code? It probably has the same problem. So I, I read somewhere that somebody had done this thing where they had pinpointed problems in device drivers. And by looking at you, you could see like where they originated. And then you could see every piece of code that copied from them, right? Because they all had the same problem, right? So, and, and you know, again, so now it's like, you know, Magic Mouse 2.0 is having some stability issues. Well, so is 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, you know, Magic Mouse X or whatever. I don't know where we can start to use letters at some point. It's because we get bored with numbers, right? So, and, and, but I mean, kind of, and I've, I've, I've strongly suggested to you guys when writing your own code for the class, well, what's one potential motto here? Right? We can never own CSE 421 model to compete with the Boy Scouts. So what's one model based on this experience? As a programmer, if you really want your stuff to work and you want to know that it works, what should you, what should you do? Test it. That's a good idea, right? But the problem here is that a lot of times these bugs are bugs that, that wouldn't be uncovered by testing because they aren't necessarily bugs yet, right? They may be, a lot of this comes from, I think, usually bad interface design, you know, relying on side effects that aren't part of interface specifications, right? My motto here is don't use code you don't understand, right? Certainly don't cut and paste large blobs of code into your system without at least like going through and being like, what is this doing, right? Like, what is this doing? Okay.
Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit because we're kind of running out of time. So there's, there's been a lot of work in this area, all motivated. This is not a super sexy area, unfortunately, but these are real problems, right? And there's a lot of interesting stuff that's going on. So, so Windows, in particular, has been really working with the driver community to try to improve driver quality. Right? There's been a bunch of different fronts. Uh, they have user mode driver tools now, so you can write drivers that run in user space, meaning that unlike other drivers, they don't get loaded into that big blob of monolithic kernel code that can cause the system to fail if it crashes, right? And then there's also been a lot of really interesting work on these sort of like uh, static uh, programming language-based tools for uh, checking and verifying device drivers. I mean, the, what would be the really, you know, ignore the virtualization bit for a bit. Well, I mean, what would be the real magic pill here that would solve this whole problem? It would put thousands of people out of work but what would be the magic pill that would solve this open? Standard, standard interface. Well, maybe a standard interface, but what do I really want? I come up with a new device, and the hard, let's say the hardware guys, and this is not always true, let's say the hardware guys do a fantastic job of documenting the hardware features. What do I really want? Plug and play. I want plug and play, but what, what does that mean for a device driver? Yeah, why not just generate the driver automatically? from the hardware, like I feed in the hardware spec, and I have some sort of piece of code that just generates the device driver that does the right thing, right? It understands whatever driver interface it's trying to touch, whether it's Windows or Linux or whatever, it understands the hardware specs, and it just fills in the rest, right? And then if the hardware spec changes, I generate a new device driver, right? And, and then, at least, you know, then, then where are the bugs gonna be? in the code that generates the device driver, right? But those, those might be easier to fix, right? That's, that's a broader surface. If more people use the tool, it's like compiler bugs, right? Compiler bugs get discovered because many people use compilers and see the output, right? So if you could push a tool like this and you got a lot of people to use it, you could potentially get a small bit of, of code generation stuff that would be really, really highly tested and, and effective, right? Um, and most approaches, again, use the same, the same key technique, which is w they assume the drivers are gonna make mistakes and they try to make sure those mistakes don't kill the entire kernel, right? And again, I mean, the, the, the real tension here is that drivers need direct access to hardware, right? So that's, that's the struggle. All right, uh, let me skip this slide. Okay, so, so now, now let's step back for a minute and we'll look at the complexity thing. So let's say you were a normal software developer, a normal good software developer, right? Somebody who has taken this class and all the other great classes we have here in the department and has learned about the right way to do things how do you structure a large, complex software project? Design. design it well, right? So yeah, we do a lot of design up front. But what do I usually do? What's the usual thing that you start to do when you, when you write a big, complex piece of code? Break it down into smaller pieces, right? Smaller pieces are easier to test. They're easier to think about, right? You, you create modules. And each module supports a well-defined interface. You document the interfaces carefully. Callers know what behavior to expect. They know what behavior not to expect, right? So, so yeah, this is the standard way of designing uh, kernels. And, and also, in operating system, and when we do operating systems, in the case of operating systems kernel, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so we also might want to minimize the code that can cause a fault, right? So if you can, if, one way of thinking about it is monolithic kernels, anything in that big blob of code can potentially crash the machine. What I might want to do is refactor that code base so that I have a small amount of code that can crash the system if it's wrong, and then a lot of other code that can crash safely. So why, so why do I want to minimize the amount, maybe this is obvious, but why do I want to minimize the amount of code that can cause a fault? What does that allow me to do? Well, allows me to find faults, but also allows me to test the crap out of that code, right? Like, you know, just really, really make sure that that small trusted code base is secure, right? So in, in the 80s and 90s, there was a great deal of interest in what were called microkernel architectures, right? And microkernel architectures are kind of like, let's apply standard good software development practices to kernels, right? So here's my model with the kernel, right? Again, I have, you know, this is the everything box that I had up before, right? I've got hardware down here, and, and maybe I, I, I don't like this layer in here, but I didn't create this picture. I, I, once in a while I find a picture I like on the internet. It doesn't happen often. Um, but here's the application, you know, I make system calls and then there's all this other stuff that goes on, okay? And all this is in user mode and this is all in kernel mode, meaning that anything that fails in here can trigger a fail of the entire system, right? My microkernel-based operating system is different, right? So again, what have I done? I have minimized the footprint 
of the code that can cause a problem, the code that needs to run in privileged mode. And microkernels had, had standard ideas about, to do, about how to do this. And one of them was simply the, the principle of parsimony, right? If it doesn't have to interact with hardware, it shouldn't be in the kernel. Right, so this blue piece down here is now called the kernel. It includes some very, very basic IPC, uh, which is necessary to allow all these other things to communicate with each other. Maybe little pieces of the virtual memory subsystem that have to interact with hardware. A little bit of scheduling support, but again, if I can find a way to do it outside of this trusted code base, I would do it that way, right? And what sits on top of here? So now what I'm doing is I'm taking these other things, like the Unix, so, so one of the things that microkernels used to want to be able to do is offer these different personalities, right? So let's say I have this really, really low level thing. Well, this is no longer a Unix kernel. This is a microkernel, it has a different interface. And so what I have on top is a Unix server, right? That uses the low level microkernel interface but provides the POSIX interface on top, right? What might this allow me to do, right? So now I've kind of decoupled some of my kernel stuff from the way the machine looks to programs. So it turned out that Windows NT actually had, was, was based in some ways on some of these ideas. And one of, so one of the things that happened with microkernels, I know I'm running out of time, is that they, they influenced monolithic kernel design more than they succeeded in their own right, right? So Windows NT described itself as a hybrid operating system. Linus Torvalds uh, considered that term to be marketing. Right? But, but one of the things Windows NT did was try to borrow a lot of the ideas. So Windows NT had this thing called personalities, which meant that there was some small core of the system which it referred to as the executive, and then the Windows interface was implemented in a trusted library that ran on top. So it turned out that, that NT actually also for a while had a POSIX uh, personality. Right? So it had some limited, and I don't think it worked that well, and I'm not sure it's supported anymore, but it had a limited support for running uh, you, you know, applications that use the POSIX interface. So you can compile your Linux, you know, uh, things to use the, the standard Linux or POSIX interfaces, and you could run them in a Windows NT kernel, right? So that's kind of funky, all right? Um, let's see what time it is. Maybe I'll finish. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to finish microkernels on Friday, and we'll also start a little bit about performance. So, uh, yeah, Simon 3 is coming out today. I wish it was Monday. I wish I had lectured it. But I enjoyed the day off. So I will see you guys on Friday. And we will finish our discussion of kernel structure.